<clears throat> Please be seated. <clears throat> this last Sunday after the Epiphany always features the transfiguration of Jesus. It's the culmination of the celebration of the coming of light and life into the world in a time, at least in part of the, of the world, where the darkness finally is starting to dissipate and the light is increasing. Even though today we may have a lot of sunlight, it sure is cold outside. But nevertheless, the apostles, Peter, James, and John, have this encounter on the mountain. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe the situation, each with a little change. And here it's Elijah with Moses. Elijah's name comes first. And the scholars talk about why that might be. And it seems as though it's because Jesus is seen particularly as he's addressed by Peter as rabbi, as teacher, that he's prophetic more than a giver of the law. He's, a revel he's revealing who God truly is. And that's one of the reasons why we also have the story of the, uh, the ascension of Elijah in the first reading today. Elijah's importance can't be exaggerated among the Jews because today even the observant Jews will always set a place at the table at the Passover for Elijah because they expect him to come before the Messiah would present himself. So putting Elijah first before Moses was another invitation to those who would hear the gospel to understand that now that Elijah has come, he's pointing the way to the real deal, to Jesus, who then gets revealed in all of this splendor and glory. And then with the voice, the voice that was heard when Jesus was baptized, that's now heard by the apostles loudly and clearly, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And Jesus then does one of those things that continues to make people scratch their heads. When he does a miracle or something tre tremendous happens like this, he says, don't tell anybody about this. And it would be a uh, kind of a neat, neat trick to not just lose your, uh, let's say, your self-control a little bit to talk about what happened when the three of them got back to the other apostles. They probably asked, what happened? And they'd say, nothing. You know, not much, you know, a little windy, a little bright, whatever they might have said to try to excuse the situation and not reveal it. But he tells them not to say anything because seeing this glory of Jesus, just like all the rest of the time during the season of Epiphany that Jesus performs a miracle or does some kind of a cure. Uh, all of these ways of revealing that the Messiah is in their midst, they all are only part of the picture. And Jesus gets them into that mindset that no, it's not only this glory that you see, this splendor that also says who I am. But none of this is going to make any sense. None of those miracles will make any sense. None of this stuff is going to make sense at all unless you remember 
that there's the cross that has to come first. It's the cross that separates the disciples from the just the onlookers, from the spectators. It's the cross that ultimately makes the difference between those who commit their lives to following Jesus, the crucified one, who's willing to die for their sake and for the sake of all humanity in order to enter into his glory. Remember what's said on the road to Emmaus when Jesus, unbeknownst to uh, the two disciples, Cleopas and his companion, what is going on? And they're saying, you know, well, Jesus asks them, well, what's happened? And then they tell him, and then he starts to explain the scriptures to them. And he said that, don't you understand that Christ first had to suffer before he entered into his glory? And then they begin to understand. And then at the table, they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, and then he disappears. But it's that idea that without Jesus' suffering and dying on the cross, none of the rest of this makes any sense. There had to be a way, not just of paying the debt for sin, but also of taking suffering and sin and even death itself and breaking the power once for all. That's why the Father's voice says, listen to him. Because what Jesus is saying to them and to the other disciples and ultimately to us is what the truth for life truly is. What it needs to be for us. And to remember that, yes, we are called to enter into glory with God at the end of the journey. But there is suffering that will come as a consequence of those decisions to follow Jesus. For some, it means persecution and maybe even being put to death. For some, it means being rejected by family, by friends, maybe the loss of a job, even being made unwelcome in a particular neighborhood. We don't experience that so much here, but it happens in other parts of the world. But even here, if we begin to take this faith of ours seriously, that we might lose relationships. Family might say, don't talk about religion while you're here. You know, don't try to foist that on me. Don't try to, you know, Give your religion to me. I don't want it. I don't need it. And I'm not going to take it. All that kind of stuff that can happen when we take that, those words from the Father seriously. And yet it's the message that saves, that gives hope, that gives light, that can give peace, and they can ultimately break through the darkness that tries to overwhelm us all the time. Early this morning, I got called to the hospital for a death. A man who went in for a very simple condition and then ended up dying. Not that old in his early 70s. His two sons and his wife were there, devastated because of what happened, totally taken by surprise. And, you know, there was the intrusion of death, and it would have been just the end of everything, but they wanted to see a chaplain and they wanted to see somebody, and they wanted some prayer said, because for them, other than the 
consolation that they were seeking and the comfort that it would give was also the affirmation that life wasn't in this world wasn't all there was to the picture and that this particular suffering that their loved one went through as well as that they were enduring was not going to last forever didn't have to last forever because there was a reason to live and there was a reason to hope even with the pain and suffering of the loss and especially when it was unexpected. That they could take comfort from the words of the prayers that I was saying and just from the assurance of faith that he wasn't going to suffer anymore and that what he had hoped in and believed in and trusted in all his life was not going to be fulfilled. How many times do I encounter the opposite when people experience death, particularly a tra in a traumatic way, and they just are disconsolate? You can never say anything to them. Because as was said to me very recently, ah, a lot of good your God did. People react differently. Grief brings things out of people that maybe they ordinarily wouldn't say. But the whole point is, there is no entering into glory. There is no way of coming to rejoicing if we don't have a suffering to go through. If there isn't something that's taken away from us, if there isn't a kind of loss that takes place. We can't really appreciate what we hear and what we hope for until we experience its opposite. You know, it's only when the death of a loved one happens to us that we many times come to the full appreciation of that person's life, what it has meant to me, what it's meant to you in your own life, what that life of Jesus meant to the apostles was only going to make sense once he was died on the cross and buried in the tomb. So that when the third day came and he rose from the dead, and they're totally bewildered by that, they begin to remember the things that he said and the truth of what he spoke. And what it was that they had been looking for and hoping for, and now they knew that it was for real. It was true. Because look at what we experienced. And then the three that were on the mountain could talk about it and say, yeah, you remember when we came back from that and we didn't, we weren't supposed to talk about it? You know, we may have hinted at this or that. Well, this is what happened. We saw Jesus in his glory. We saw Jesus in, in the, the splendor that is, was his before he even came into this world. And that's what we want to share with others that ultimately there is this different way of looking at the world, that there is life, there is light, there is hope. There does not have to be this, this continuous hanging over us of gloom and doom and hopelessness and evil and despair and all the other junk that gets tossed in us day in and day out. Because, because, of what Jesus has done for us. So even when we go through our own struggles and our own worries and concerns, there are things we have to take seriously. And I'm not saying that the problems in the world around us or anything should just be poo-pooed or just said, eh, they're nothing. We're not called to live in denial. 
And we're not called to just sit back and do nothing and let everything happen around us. But we are called also to that ongoing awareness that infuses our faith, hopefully, that God is with us, that Christ died and rose so that we could live eternally with God, but also so that we could be the living members of his body in this world in the here and now. They were told not to talk about it when they came down the mountain before the whole picture was going to be seen so that people would understand that in order for Christ to enter into his glory, he had to suffer and die for the sake of humanity that needed deliverance, that needed to have the enemy, ultimately death itself, robbed of its power, not of the reality, but of its ultimate power to separate us from God and from those that we love. Because in Christ, we are alive. And in Christ, when we die, we continue to live differently, but yet we are still alive. And I had one other thought that uh, we need to remember, and that is that this is World Mission Sunday in the Episcopal Church. And we can often forget, that's why on the second Sunday of Epiphany, when it was Companion Diocese Sunday, I spoke as I did because we needed to be reminded that our responsibility is to make sure that this message of love and forgiveness and hope and joy continues to be preached throughout the world. Even where it's been heard any number of times for centuries, it still needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be proclaimed among us. We need to live it out in such a way that people who are looking can find a reason to endure and not just to endure, but to get some satisfaction and meaning out of life and to have some hope. So we do pray today for the mission of the Episcopal Church participating in Christ's mission of human salvation, of trying to continue to give this message. And it's the only reason that the message ever convinces is not because of its logic, not because of the rites and ceremonies and words that accompany the truth of the gospel, but it's the testimony of each one of us that makes it attractive, that makes it something people want to hear. Because we come to understand the place of suffering, the place of setbacks, etc., in the whole plan of God, in that whole vision of the glory that it awaits. And so this coming Wednesday, we begin our Lenten journey. We will probe a little more those things that bring difficulty, darkness, despair into human life. And we will continue to ponder how Jesus brings us a different vision gives us hope so that when we come to the renewal of our faith, a renewal of our baptismal covenant at Easter, that we will become more fully alive and convinced and energized to live out this faith and to be willing to take the risk of sharing it for God's glory and for the salvation of other people and for our own.
the Lord comes to us today and gives himself to us, both to those who are here as well as to those who are far off. He comes in his word. He comes in the presence of each other who believe, but especially through the Holy Eucharist, where he gives himself to us as once he gave himself for us.